السلام عليكم انا محمد يعوز بماكو الدوائيه برحب بحضراتكم وبشكركم على الحضور آه النهارده معانا دكتوره هبه يوسف الخشاب كونسلتنت في نيورو بيدياتريكس اند دكتور سليمان الحبيب ميديكال جروب اند بروفيسور اوف بيدياتريكس في عين شمس يونيفرستي آه النهارده هتكلمنا عن نيو كوفيد 19 اند بيشنت ويز اي دي اتش دي ان ابروكسيمتلي 45 مينيتس افتر ال 45 مينيتس ان شاء الله نقدر نستقبل اسئله حضراتكم ويلكم ان شاء الله انتم تشير معانا ان شاء الله افتر السيشن باذن الله اتفضلوا دكتوره السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, first, I would like to thank Pemego for the invitation. Well, I will be talking today about the patients with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and the effect of the new COVID-19 on them. I hope, inshallah, it will be interesting subject to uh, uh, useful. So my objectives for today are overview of the attention deficit hyperactivity disorders as regards etiology, symptoms, diagnosis, as well as treatment, and how to deal with individuals with ADHD during the COVID-19 pandemic as regards parents, teachers, as well as doctors. This is a common scenario in our clinics, even in the general pediatrics clinics. A mother who is bringing her eight-year son for evaluation after being suspended from the school, for jumping on his seat, teasing other children, not following direction. He spends two to three hours a night with homework that he never successfully completes. His mother wants to know what is wrong with her child. So the child is a victim of, yes, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is the boy. He is the worthless, the bad, the dumpy, the lazy, at school. He went to school in his class and as usual, he forgot his homework. His teacher asked him and he doesn't have excuse. He burst with answer even before waiting till the end of the question. So his answers are always wrong. He cannot stay calmly, moving always, disturbing his schoolmate. This is what happens at school. So the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a chronic condition that affects millions of children and often continues into adulthood. It is a condition characterized by problems in attention, impulsivity, as well as overactivity. And it is a very common, very common, even many celebrities are victims of attention deficit hyperactivity, all the celebrities we like. And uh, I, uh, I prefer the example of um, uh, the swimmer, Michael Phillips, who got many Olympics and he was a victim of attention deficit hyperactivity on treatment and he overcome his deficit by swimming. By understanding potential causes such as brain structure, development and genetics, scientists can come closer to solve the mystery of attention deficit hyperactivity and those afflicted can receive the help they need. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of attention deficit hyperactivity. It was discovered since long time, even before the 18th century. Here you can see a, uh, a picture who had been who, uh, was painted in uh, 1670 called the village school and you can see kids who are jumping and not staying and not staying at their places later on the, in the 18th century uh, prof alexander christon wrote a book called an inquiry in the nature and origin of the mental derangement and he mentioned in the book entity of such 
individuals who are having incapacity of attending with a necessary degree of constancy to one object, almost always poor concentration. And he mentioned also that when born with a person, it becomes evident at every at a very early period of life and has a very bad effect which is similar to our new attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It was later on, on uh, 1902, when the uh, British pediatrician George Still uh, discovered abnormal defect in a moral control of children. He wrote uh, papers about this um, finding that there is some kind of info of kids at school, they have abnormal defect in their moral control. Later on, on 1936, they discovered the benzedrine, the famous benzedrine, which is a stimulant. It was used to treat patients with encephalitis, which was a pandemic at that time. And by prof uh, this professor Alexander, uh, he mentioned that using this medication for treating patients with encephalitis, he discovered a behavior and performance improvement in school for such kids. However, his contemporary just neglected this finding and we wait till 1952 when the American Pediatric Association issued the first DSM, which is Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder. And however, even in 1952, the hyperkinetic child or this entity was not mentioned. It was on the second edition, which was issued in 1962, when they include the hyperkinetic impulsive disorder. And on 1958, the famous methylphenidate was discovered, the Ritalin, which we are using till now. However, it was not used by this time and it was used later on. On 1980, DSM, the third edition, changed the definition to ADD. ADD, and it was mentioned that this ADD had two subtypes, attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, as well as attention deficit disorder without hyperactivity. And finally, in 1987, the disorder got its name in a, re in a revised edition of the DSM-3. In the fourth edition of the DSM, which was released in 2000, the three subdivision of the ADHD was used in attentive, hyperactive, as well as hyperactive impulse. So it took too long time until we reach to the diagnosis and the definition and the name of the attention deficit hyperactivity. So, what are symptoms of this very common disorder? We are all facing this type of child, even in our clinic. Child who is extremely hyperactive, jumping, climbing stairs, and always on the run. Her teacher had hard time to get her back to her class. This is our boy at school who had poor organization, who, had, who is easily distracted, and he is also forgetful. This is his homework. He will forget it. Oh, he will go to school. He will blurt out answer without waiting to hear the question. He cannot sit. He will always fidget and stir. He has poor attention span. He can never sit in his place. He would leave his seat to go to do anything else. This, what we call the difficult child. Symptoms of attention deficit is divided into categories, into subtypes. We have the inattention symptoms which you saw in form of disorganization, lack of focus, difficulty giving attention to details, and trouble staying on a topic while talking. The hyperactivity symptoms in form of 
fidget and squirm when seated, get up frequently to walk or run, or run around, and have trouble playing quietly or doing quiet hobbies. These boys are also too much hyper talkative. They, they are talking, always talking, always talking. And this symptom will continue into the adult attention the fastest. When you, fi you find a, a family bringing their child because he is uh, having some symptoms of hyperactivity and inattention, it is not uncommon to find either the father or the mother who is hyper talkative, who is impatient, who cannot wait. And this means that many of the family member could be affected with the same disorder which was not diagnosed during their childhood period. While the impulsive child is impatient, had a hard time to wait to talk or react, blurt out answer. And these are the three subtypes. Uh, the disorder could be predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, or the combined type. Usually we saw the combined type in boys, while the uh, predominantly inattentive is a common uh, manifestation of girls with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So, how I'm counseling the parents of my patients in the clinic? By this slide. I'm usually giving them this slide, this curve, and I'm explaining that it is known that the hyperactivity will disappear. This is a not a matter, it's only a matter of time. Any boy with hyperactivity, uh, as hyperactivity, it will disappear or completely be banished by the age of puberty at 14 to 15 years of age. However, however, which is important that the detractability and the impulsivity will still continue and will continue even to the adult life if the patient is not treated early. So, the hyper, even if the hyperactivity will disappear, still we have the main problem of distractibility and poor attention, which can continue with the child in his school life, in his adult life, and will affect him permanently. So what is the etiology of the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? From where it comes? You can see that this disorder has a neuroanatomical and a neurochemical etiology. It has a neuroanatomical, neurochemical origin. And as everything, every tiny disease, tiny uh, character we, ha we are having, genetic origin plays a role. PNS insult, as well as environmental issues and family relations can play a role in the etiology of ADHD. We will review the parts of the anatomical part of the brain which could be related to the attention deficit hyperactivity. We can see here the frontal lobe, the amygdala, the hippocampus, basal ganglia, putamen, and the cerebellum. And as you know, the brain which depend completely on the presence of the neurons. And neurons will have a synapse at the synaptic level between neurons each other. There is discharge of neurotransmitter. ADHD brain have low level of neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is linked arm in arm to do the dopamine and it helps control of the brain's reward. So the ADHD brain has impaired neurotransmitter activity in frontal cortex, and this region controls the high level function, attention, executive function, and organization, as well as limbic system. This region, which is located deeper in the brain, and it regulates our emotions and attention, and basal ganglia. Deficiency here can cause interbrain communication and information to be short circuit. That results in inattention or impulsivity. While reticular activating system is the major relay system that enter the information to brain. A deficiency here can cause inattention, impulsivity, or hyperactivity. So we 
know now that the neurochemicals are the main etiological factor affecting these kids. It is not a psychological disorder. It's not a psychological disorder. It is due to neurochemical deficiency. Dopamine, norepinephrine, as well as serotonin. Dopamine and norepinephrine are uh, important for concentration, attention, alertness, as well as balanced mood. While serotonin is the most important hormone for the satisfaction, learning memory, pleasure, and relaxation. I told you that the etiology is not only neurochemical, but also neuroanatomical, which means that there is a neuroanatomical defect in such kids. And this had been proved by an MRIs, which had been uh, done for patients with ADHD, and it showed smaller anterior right frontal lobe, significantly smaller corpus callosum, and smaller caudate nuclei. Uh, it is to be noted, we are not doing the MRI as a routine for patients of ADHD, and we are not searching for this finding. This is just uh, uh, for experimental explanation of the disease. So even by the functional MRI, we can see that there is less blood flow in regions of the brain while working on a task in individuals with ADHD versus individuals with no ADHD. As I told you, genetics, genetics which is the base for all diseases. Typically, number of genes are involved, many of which directly affect dopamine neurotransmission. Those involved with dopamine include that, GRD4, GRD5, long, long series I will not mention. But the presence of a one gene, which is called LPHN3, is estimated to be responsible for about 9% of the cases. And when this variant is present, people are particularly responsive to stimulant medication. So, twin study showed ADHD as a genetic disorder. And this slide, although it appeared to be condensed a little bit, but I, um, I like because it will explain uh, how all of these factors will collaborate to give us the final picture of our patient with uh, inattention and hyperactivity as well as impulsivity. You can see here the genetic and the environmental factor which lead to the neurobiological changes and leading to neuropsychological impairment finally give us the symptom profile. What about the environmental factors? We have environmental factors which can add, which can uh, uh, be associated to the predisposition to the attention deficit. We have the predisposition, as I mentioned, usually by genetic cause. We have the neuroanatomical and neurobehavior, and maybe environmental factors will add on, like extreme preterm, extreme low birth weight. And, um, you know, in our general clinic, even, we met a baby extremely preterm with a many disorder, including the attention deficit, uh, autism, uh, including um, uh, many other mental uh, illness. The alcohol intake during pregnancy, tobacco smoke, exposure to organophosphate, allergy to certain foods, infection. 30% of children with traumatic brain injury later on develop ADHD, and about 5% of cases are due to brain damage. And here is some myth about our disorder. Eating refined sugar, which is a very common um, contraindication for, pay, for children with attention to fast hyperactivity, especially at school. No evidence, no evidence that eating, eating sugar will lead or will increase the attention to fast hyperactivity. It is just a myth. As well as watching TV, family chaos, and poverty. So, how we can diagnose this patient? Is there a possibility of diagnosing them? Actually, ADHD is diagnosed by an assessment of a person's childhood behavior and mental development. We need to rule out the effects of drugs, medication, and other medical or psychiatric problems as explanation. We usually put into account the feedback from parents and teacher 
Most cancer diagnosis began after the teacher raised concern. So, how we diagnose? Still, we are using just criteria uh, like a neuropsychological assessment to diagnose. In North America, we use what we call DSM-5 criteria, which is a Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health uh, Disorder, the fifth edition, okay? And in the European country, we usually use the International Classification of Disease, number 10. With the DSM-4 and even with the DSM-5 criteria, the diagnosis of ADHD is three to four times more likely than with the ICD-10 criteria. And I will explain it to you. And you know, always in the North America, they are not so much conservative like in European country. In European countries, they are conservative in diagnosis, conservative, conservative in uh, um, investigation, as well as conservative in treatment. Um, and this is because the ICD uh, classification it didn't put together the hyperactivity, impulsivity, and attention deficit as a full uh, panel of symptoms. I will show you later on in uh, upcoming slides. So um, we are using self-rating scale, such as the EGHD rating scale, Vanderbilt. I'm personally using the Vanderbilt in my clinic, and uh, I evaluate the patient of attention deficit, and I follow them with this Vanderbilt uh, diagnostic rating scale. So these are the subtypes we mentioned already. You know that now, uh, by now, that we have a primary uh, hyperactive, hyperactive impulsive, and the combined type. And according to the DSM, this subdivision is based on the presence of at least six out of nine, six out of nine long-term, lasting at least six months. So six symptoms lasting at least six months. Uh, symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, or both, all the three criteria. To be considered, the symptoms must have appeared by the age of 6 to 12 and occur in more than one environment, e.g. at home and at school or work. I'm asking the family, it's normal that you got a baby who is hyperactive at home. It's very normal. Any child can do whatever he wants in his private place, but he cannot, he should be appropriate when he goes outside. That's why. I'm asking if this behavior is only at home or it was um, a complaint at grand uh, at the grandfather home, for example, at school or at work. So it must be evident that it is causing social, school or work related problems. So um, I was mentioning all of that we have the DSM and we reached to the DSM-4. And now, by 2017, we have this DSM-5, which is the last edition. And uh, the difference is not large, but they put the age of onset before 12, not seven years as in the DSM. So till the age of 12 years, if the boy was not diagnosed, still we can diagnose him. And uh, they um, add the comorbidity. And this is very important because the comorbidity as autism, for example, OCD, was not put before in the previous DSM criteria uh, as association to the HHD. And we know that it is a very common to have patient with two entities. So I was just telling you that we have a different classification, which is the international classification of disease, the European one, and we will go uh, quickly uh, over it. So the, according to the ICD, they mention uh, the disease as a conduct disorder, and it is referred to as hyperkinetic hyper conduct disorder. Otherwise, the disorder is classified as disturbance activity and attention other than hyperkinetic disorder. So I mean, the hyperkinetic is a disorder uh, by itself, while the inattention and the impulsivity is different. They didn't, they didn't add the symptoms of the three uh, together while classifying the patient. There is innovation and changes which will happen the, in the ICD-11 classification. And uh, this um, was issued, um, was released in 2019 by the World Health Assembly. And uh, they state that this transition from the ICD-10 to ICD-11 will be done on January 1, 2022. This will be nearly similar to the DSM-5. Coming to management. How we manage such kids? We have many treatment options. 
or a combined a treatment option. We should combine all this together, medication, behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, as well as educational technique. All of this should be associated together for the uh, benefit of the patient. Diet, what do you think about diet? Is dietary modification important in patients with ADHD? We can see that dietary modification may be of a benefit in a very small proportion of children with ADHD. No need to change the diet of a child with ADHD because the evidence didn't show that it will bring much benefit. A 2014 review found that elimination of diet results in a small overall benefit. While 2016 review stated that the use of gluten-free as standard treatment is discouraged. Iron, magnesium, iodine may also have an effect on EGHD symptoms. These are important, as well as omega-3, which is used, uh, which there is a modest benefit about it, and it is not recommended in place of traditional treatment, but add-on. So, this are a paper which was published in 2004, and they found that the serum ferritin level is important. And low iron stores contribute to ADHD, and children may benefit from supplementation. Supplementation. This was a meta-analysis and a systematic review on iron status in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and it was published in 2017. They conclude same. This is another meta-analysis, meta and it was uh, the largest one. It includes 17 articles. It examines the association between ADHD and iron levels, and they found that difference in peripheral iron levels in children with ADHD and healthy control, especially in the peripheral serum ferritin, not iron. So we are measuring the serum ferritin, not the iron. And the severity of AGHD was significantly higher in patients with iron deficiency. Microbiota. I was giving an, uh, a lecture last week about the microbiota and coming across many papers uh, that mentioned that the microbiota is very uh, important and has a potential effect on uh, the patient of uh, AGHD. They are useful. And there is another uh, recent article which shows that there is a reduced microbiome alpha diversity in young patients with ADHD, and this was just published in 2012, and their finding provides a basis for a systematic longitudinal assessment of the role of the gut microbiome in ADHD, yielding promising potential for both prevention and therapeutic intervention. Before the age of six, we are not using, or before the age of five, we are not using medication. So we depend on behavioral therapy for preschool children. So parents should be trained in behavior therapy, and they should be trained on positive communication, positive reinforcement, structure, and discipline. And therapists should meet regularly the family to monitor the progress and provide support and between sessions, parents practice using what they have been uh, taught by the therapist. Coming to medication, which is the cornerstone. Cornerstone. Repeat, I repeat it. It is a cornerstone. We cannot treat attention deficit even if the family came to tell us that they are not believing on medication. It is not uh, of sense because this treatment, as I told you, it is in neuro behavioral, neurometabolic. So we need to treat it with treatment like stimulant, mainly methylphenidate and derivative, ritalin, and the most recent one, prolonged one, is concerta, as well as amphetamine and derivative. While the non-stimulant like antidepressant, antipsychotic atomoxetine, uh, which is a stratera, the famous stratera we are always uh, using. Um, so it's important to explain to the family that as I told you, hyperactivity, because they came to the clinic, they feel guilty, and as I feel guilty to give the medication as if they are giving the medication to just get relief from the severe symptoms they are facing in, at home. So I'm explaining to them, you are giving them the best. Your kids deserve this medication, and actually, it is a magic, a magic. This is a magic uh, in my clinic. 
when patient came with a typical picture of attention deficit hyperactivity and they just taught him on a stimulant so, or even on the non-stimulant atomoxetine and all symptoms improved dramatically, dramatically. This are the uh, family who are coming happily to the clinic to just uh, thank me. So, so it's fly, lightning fast. Can you control? You agree now that we can control. This are the comorbid manifestation I told you. Uh, we never get one, psycho one uh, psychological or uh, disorder alone. Usually um, we met two further criteria associated with attention deficit, or not usually, it, it, it is common to find, for example, the OCD, ODD, autism, and anxiety, uh, the OCD, as I told you, or even depression in association with the ADHD. Uh, this is a little bit important because uh, uh, the ADHD will not finish. And this is um, one of the points and we need to counsel the family in the clinic about it. 80% of, of the children with ADHD will persist into adolescence and even into adulthood. With increasing age, hyperactivity will decrease, but inattention, impulsivity, disorganization, uh, disorganization and relationship difficulties persist. If not properly treated, we will get an, a, an adult ADHD with a combination of medication, psychological behavior. We can control, we can control the symptoms. This is a DSM uh, criteria for adults, and I will show it to you here in this uh, slide. So mainly in the preschool, we have the behavioral disturbance in form of the hyperactivity. When the patient came at school age, we have the academic problem and self-esteem. Especially with the adolescents, they have a problem with self-esteem, which is very common. And we get here smoking, substance abuse is common with these guys, especially. At college age, academic failure, very poor self-esteem, substance abuse, accident, occupational difficulty. And this will continue to adults. So the adult with attention deficit usually have occupational failure. He cannot continue in a single job. Usually they left job, they um, went from one job to other, maybe they, they have a second marriage, um, uh, um, um, uh, relations outside the marriage is also common in adult with ADHD, I'm sorry. And we come now to the second part of the lecture, which will be very short, don't worry. So we come to what we are facing, all of us we are facing now, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. We are now in a pandemic and I will not explain the symptoms, I will not explain what we are passing through because you all know. But what do you think about our patient with ADHD? Are they, uh, these individuals more susceptible to COVID-19? What are the implications of this pandemic on them? and how we can manage this individual during the pandemic. So, adolescents with ADHD, especially and comorbid substance abuse, are the ones who are more susceptible to the COVID-19. But also, um, kids or children with ADHD, there is no evidence to show that there is uh, any uh, incidence to get the COVID-19 more than others. They have the same risk. So, what is the impact? These individuals are more vulnerable to the distress caused by the pandemic and physical distancing. They cannot, they cannot tolerate. They are hyperactive already and they are a uh, bored person. Easily bored. So coronavirus, which is scary for all of us, for th uh, those children with comorbid and anxiety, school closure and health threats are downright paralyzing them. So how we can help? How we can help them? I uh, found this uh, guidelines which is the European guidelines, European EGHD guideline, and it was published in uh, just in April 17. And uh, these guidelines give, uh, give um, mention that uh, given the requirement for physical distancing, relevant service provision should continue via telephone or appropriate online video technology, in line with current recommendation for the use of the telepsychiatry e.g. the guidance coming from UK Royal College or American Psychiatric Association. And this is like the rest of uh, diseases who are, uh, which uh, we are continuing to treat via telephone or online uh, system. 
tool. They put a guidelines for teachers. Uh, they mentioned that schools and teachers should try to monitor students with ADHD, especially adolescents, as a priority group because of their disorganization and increased level of risk. Are they participating in online classes? They should follow if these kids are participating or not, if they are submitting their task or not, and if there is any concern about their social and emotional well-being. For parents, they uh, put uh, guidelines that behavioral parenting strategy is very important because when face-to-face -face support is not possible, parents will have to rely on a self-help version of evidence-based system. Some are support, some evidence are supported by trial evidence. Some online system have only shown to have value, while some application could do more harm than good. That's why I'm putting this slide, and you can uh, take a capture, please, because it contains all the resources uh, which are evidence-based uh, for educators and families. These are very helpful resources for family and educator of uh, patients with ADHD, uh, which uh, they can use during this pandemic. They give essential messages for parents, which is, Building your child's self-confidence. Please make sure all family members know what is expected of them. In relation to other non-pharmacological strategy, individuals using neurofeedback or cognitive training should be encouraged to continue practicing transfer exercise during homework and give them new challenges. As regard treatment plan, newly diagnosed individual with ADHD, if clinically indicated, and recommended in standard national guidelines should be started on a pharmacological treatment after completion of the initial assessment. We will not postpone their treatment. If they are uh, diagnosed by the standard national guidelines, start treatment immediately. A non-individual with ADHD should continue their medication as usual. And we should um, follow parents of children or adolescents that they should avoid increasing doses or adding doses beyond those prescribed. Because uh, children at home, maybe we will get crisis, we will have stress related to the condition. So the family uh, usually coming to us if we can increase the dose. We will try to um, advise them to avoid this increasing just to keep the dose uh, the kids are on. Use of antipsychotic medication to manage disruptive behavior and sedative when not clinically indicated should be avoided. No strong rationale to introduce weekend drug holidays. This is a very important point because some uh, are um, are giving drug holidays, which I, I usually I, I don't like, and I'm not giving uh, a lot of drug holidays for my patients. But however, if we are even giving drug holidays during this pandemic, don't give. This was is the recommendation. So uh, most of these kids have a sleep disturbance, which should not be. Um, Due, uh, due only to their uh, disorder, it could be due to the distress we are facing to the appropriate sleep uh, uh, pattern uh, because of the uh, curfew and because of Ramadan time. So uh, try to put the melatonin dose at the usual dose, which is five to six and don't increase. Advise them to do appropriate sleep hygiene, uh, which should be implemented or reinforced. Headache, which can occur during treatment with psychostimulant. Given the uncertainty about the possible unfavorable effects of the ibuprofen in patients with COVID-19, paracetamol is preferred over ibuprofen for pain management. And this is a guidelines I found which are released from the Australian group and they mention nearly same of the European one with same, same recommendation. Uh, they advise also the family not to increase the dose or to add any antipsychotic medication. This one is very, very important. If person tests positive for COVID-19 and he is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder patient, no need to stop taking his medication because there is a likely advantage associated with reduction of impulsivity and hyperactivity. We should consider reducing or stopping medication only if they experience severe symptoms such as high blood pressure, pulse, or breathing difficulty. And these are the guidelines uh, they give to the, the children. You can also 
uh, capture the picture if you want. And they advise on home monitor. So as a summary, we can see that the COVID-19 and the related physical distancing measure are presenting many challenges for children, young people and their family. And these challenges are likely to be considerably greater for those with ADHD. It will be important to draw upon the strategy routinely recommended in parent-focused ADHD intervention, as well as mental well-being intervention. The inability to do routine face-to-face -face clinical visit to initiate and monitor medication should not be viewed as an absolute contraindication to pharmacotherapy. Instead, the risk and benefit of initiating or maintaining medication during COVID-19 restriction implemented in some country should be reviewed. You know, the medication, especially the stimulant or um, red prescription, controlled prescription. So the, usually uh, we need to call the patient or uh, one of the family members to come to take the prescription from the clinic. And uh, um, we have many families who are afraid to come to visit the hospital because of the corona time. And this may lead to this uh, interruption of the treatment of these kids. And um, that's why I'm thinking if it is possible to reduce the restriction which is implemented over the red uh, prescription, this will help the patient to continue and not uh, to stop their medication during this hard time. And finally, I would, uh, I would like to finish with this quote I usually uh, like by uh, Albert Einstein. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. ADHD kids are not stupid, they are genius kids and they deserve to be treated. Please, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahiba, for the comprehensive and informative lecture. Uh, now I will ask uh, if uh, anyone from the attendees want to ask Dr. Ahiba any question. You can use the chat box or you can open your mic to ask directly uh, uh, your question. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Ahiba and, and Dina Salah from UEE. Uh, thank you so much for the informative uh, lecture and the guidelines. Actually, it would really um, uh, put your hands on very uh, important tips and clues. And uh, your suggestion about um, giving some um, better measures to release control prescriptions. So I'm sharing that here in UEE, they started uh, giving the medication for three months instead of one month to overcome this problem. Another you are thing, right, you know? Yes, you yeah. see. Another yes. thing is that I... I, I about the holidays, so you don't recommend um, at all giving the holidays for like weekends, especially many patients will come up. Uh, we are not attending schools anymore. Can we lower the dose? Can we stop the medication? So what do you think about this? Um, thank you, Dina, for the nice question. Yes, um, yeah, sometimes I'm, I'm giving the weekend holiday according to the condition. If the child is only inattentive, the problem is mainly at school, it is it is uh, very common to give the holiday since he will not be studying during weekend if he is not studying or at least i will give only one day not friday and saturday because uh, usually they have uh, study they have um, in the usual time they have training and they have uh, they need to be concentrating but if the problem is a combined type with hyperactivity, stopping the medication, especially during this COVID time, it's very difficult to, and very distressing to the family. Kids are very hyperactive and they will make a lot of distress, um, uh, will add to the, to the stress uh, in the family, in the, for their care, for the, their um, uh, sibs, um, the other children at home. So uh, according to the recommendation, as you see the European and the Australian one, it is not preferred to give a holiday during this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. If uh, any other question you want to ask Dr. Heba? You can only just uh, open your mic and ask Dr. Heba directly. Uh, there is a question for uh, for routine tests for all patients. What? Can you repeat uh, the question, please? Someone, yeah, someone asked about uh, you must do the for routine test for all patients or not? Uh, what is the, what are my routine tests I'm doing for the patients in the clinic? This uh, this maybe is this you what you mean? 
usually routinely I'm doing for uh, the patients um, serum ferritin, as I mentioned, and vitamin D especially, because low vitamin D and the ferritin can be corrected and it will help. EEG, I'm doing it before starting the stimulant because of the, um, the possible association between seizures and the stimulant. So we want to know at least the standard condition before starting uh, the stimulant. Uh, the um, uh, picture of EG. If we are, if I'm not planning to give a stimulant, I'm not doing EG. These are the only routine tests. I'm giving them um, a vendor built uh, test, uh, and uh, I'm uh, I'm asking them to uh, answer it. Uh, for, I give them one for the family as well as one for the teacher. We have two two edition or two form of it, and this uh, all all I'm I'm doing for them. Thank you, Dr. Hiba. If uh, any other questions? Yes, I can say with Mohammed. Hello? Hey, you are? Yes, Dr. Hiba, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, Mr. Layam, I have a Dr. Mohammed. I'm a Fasim. I'm a Fasim. I'm a Fasim. I'm a consultant to the Dr. Yamatoli. Thank you very much for this comprehensive lecture. Everything I'm going to ask all the questions which I need to ask. But I have a little question, Doctora, about uh, missile candidate. Yes. Uh, to my knowledge, I think it will be ineffective after two years of age. Is that true? You, and you mentioned the lecture that we start after six. Yes. Yes. We are usually starting it after the age of six. If um, maybe you are using the missile candidate earlier in the autistic patients. But uh, for the attention deficit, uh, preschool before age of five, yeah. behavioral, and we start the medication to get uh, into their effects and to reduce the side effects, it's better to postpone it till the school age. Even if it's very difficult to give it to them because it's capsule and we don't have any yeah. uh, yeah. form. We are, we are obliged to give treatment before the age of uh, five. If we are too much obliged, I'm using the non-stimulant uh, stratera. At least we can open uh, the capsule and we can give it to them. But the concert cannot. No, no, no. They said it ineffective after two years. Ineffective. The effect is less. Oh, ineffective after two yeah. years of giving it? Yes. No, no. no after the age of two years. After the age of two years, it is ineffective. If you give it late and for a school age, it will be, it will not have a good effect. Because no children now, the children are not uh, well cured. If we uh, postpone more than two years, you mean? Yeah, if you if you postpone, if you give the missile candidate after the age of two, the effect is less than if you give it before the age of two. Age of two years? Age of two. Or two years from diagnosis? Age of two. Um, After the age Mike. of two years, no, I can hear you very well. Yeah. If you give it after the age of two years, it will be ineffective. No, 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 no. No, we are not yeah. giving yeah. We are giving, as I told you, no, it's later than this. And even if you start at any time, if you give them a therapy date, even at the age of 10 years or 11 years, you will get a magic response still. If the patient is at tension deficit, he will get the response at any mm. time. Good. Good. Okay, thank you. If, uh, if there is any question, one more last question for Dr. Heba. Uh, there is a question about the relationship of iron deficiency anemia and uh, ADHD. So, uh, mm. can you explain the uh, relationship between them? Okay, so. Um, as a relation we found, or some, um, the meta-analysis I showed, which had been published in 2017, it was published in Lancet. And this meta-analysis, they review all the paper which are uh, published for um, uh, last years in uh, relation to this condition. What they found is that low serum ferritin could be associated with increasing symptoms, increasing symptom of attention deficit. So it is not the cause, as I told you, it is not a cause, but with the presence of a low ferritin, we can find that the symptoms are more are more exaggerated, are more evident, and treating them with by uh, ferrose or by I mean sorry by uh, uh, iron supplementation will improve the symptoms in majority of these kids. So it's a finding from uh, papers from uh, many publications. 
Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, how the percentage of the combine, uh, combination of abnormal EEG and ADHD? Mm, it's a very nice question. Yes, there is um, combine, there is a known uh, in, uh, presence of abnormal uh, EEG um, uh, discharges in 10% of the cases with ADHD. It is present, but we are not treating. We are treating whenever we have symptoms. And um, even what we had been thinking uh, uh, about the present, the association of methylphenidate or the um, uh, concerta to the uh, seizures, it is not evidence-based anymore. So even if we have a discharge, we can give still the concerta and we are not afraid of uh, having uh, more discharges later on, but at least we have this standard or baseline and we can compare if any seizures happen. It could be just an association or it could be comorbidity, uh, which is known to be associated to EGHD. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hiba, for the comprehensive and informative uh, lecture and answering all questions. Uh, if you want to say a few words before uh, we closing. Uh, thank you so much for attending uh, the lecture and I hope it was uh, of benefit and you enjoyed and uh, see you in the future lectures inshallah and thank you Spimago, thank you Dr. Rashid. Thank you, thank you everyone and uh, we will see you inshallah next lecture. Stay connected and stay safe.